So welcome everyone to the first Sunday conversation of 2024, the third, excuse me, uh, presented by the Massachusetts ME, CFS, and FM Association, also known as Mass ME. Um, today's program is titled Dysautonomia 101, More Than Just POTS. And before introducing today's speakers, um, I'd like to extend a special welcome to our Mass ME members. Your membership makes it possible for the organization to host and sustain Sunday conversations, support groups, patient services, and more. And if you'd like to learn more about how membership helps the organization or to become a member, uh, please visit our website at massmecfs.org slash join. Uh, next slide. So now I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Um, first, Peter Cariani. He's a recently retired professor of neuroscience, a parent to two adult children with MECFS, and uh, as a new volunteer with our Sunday Conversations group. Um, second, we have Hala Sluss, our discussant for the program. She's a researcher and assistant professor at the UMass Chan Medical School, as well as a board member for Mass ME. Um, as well, we're going to present um, our next month's discussion. Next slide. Um, our, we'd like to announce that the event for April 21st, the third Sunday of the month, will be at 4 p.m. Eastern time, and we will continue the series focusing on specific comorbidities. Uh, we'll be joined by Michael Rubino of the Change the Air Foundation, and he'll be giving us information about how about mold and how it affects us. So we hope to see you there next month as well. Uh, so now I'd like to welcome Peter and Hala. Thank you for presenting with us today, and Peter, take it away. Okay. Um, so... Today, we're going to discuss uh, dysautonomias in the context of MECFS. Um, and uh, I must say, uh, I, can't, I come to this because of um, because our son was uh, became suddenly ill and completely disabled uh, a little more than four years ago, just before the pandemic. Um, so as a scientist, I've been trying to make sense of it, both to help him and, and also our daughter, uh, who has a different kind of MECFS, um, who developed it independently and independently of COVID. Um, but I've been trying to figure out what's going on with the disease and, and in order to help them with their medical care and also as a scientist and a curious person to try to figure out what, what the hell is going on. So um, I wanna emphasize that um, I'm not a doctor, uh, I'm a research scientist, and my main field is auditory neuroscience. So I've never given a lecture on the autonomic nervous system or MECFS. So all this, mo most of my slides I, I researched and put together uh, for this talk. Uh, and it's been very useful for me in trying to make sense of it all. Um, so there will be a recording available after the event and a PDF of the slides will also be available. Um, and I, I realize that there's a great deal of information on the slides. So don't panic uh, if it's too much, you know, if the if the if there's too much information, just listen to what I say because I'm going to um, talk about all the major points so you won't miss anything. And uh, if necessary, you can go back get the PDF uh, and and look at uh, more detail. Um, so my goal today is to provide you with a framework for thinking about dysautonomias in the context of MECFS. How might they be related? And why do so many people with MECFS have dysautonomias? Um, so whenever possible, consult licensed medical professionals, but we all know how difficult that can be. Um, yeah. So then we'll talk about that um, down the line. I'm going to try to give something for everyone. Uh, I realize there's an enormous range of expertise about MECFS. You know, many of you out there, you know, have been dealing with it for decades, uh, and some of you are new to it. Um, so I'm going to try to give something for everyone. Um, so first, we're going to discuss what neurologists mean when they use the term dysautonomia. And then in order to understand this, we'll need to look at some basic neuroscience that's related to the autonomic nervous system and the hypothalamus. Uh, so what these systems do, their functions, and what can go wrong, their dysfunctions. And um, my own orientation is as a basic scientist. So I think 
There are basic questions about ME-CFS I think we need to answer if we're ever going to find a cure. And we should always keep, we should focus on symptoms and alleviating symptoms in the short term, but we also need to look to the long term and see if a cure is possible. So why do we see a similar set of symptoms uh, that, that characterize ME-CFS, the core symptoms of that? And what causes ME-CFS? Us to be self-sustaining. So I'll try to um, give my own views about what the possible roles are. And, and the and other people out in the research community also are thinking along these lines as well. Uh, you can think of uh, all the symptoms as being isolated processes. And so we have to attack them one by one. Or you could think that there might be some various triggers, but there might be a final common pathway in which um, uh, uh, may, many of the symptoms are generated by the same underlying processes. So and along the way, I'll offer some lived experiential advice about dealing with our medical system. Um, and we'll do a brief flyover of dysautonomia diagnostics and treatments. Um, and then Halis Sluss will add additional points and give comments um, and amplifications. And then we'll end with a brief uh, question and answer segment. Um, so as I say, don't panic. And if it's too much, uh, just close your eyes and listen to what I say. Um, some resources that I found helpful in putting all this together and trying to make sense of things, they're on here. You can go here. Uh, you know, we live in an era of information democracy, really, uh, with um, Wikipedia and YouTube and lots of websites uh, that have enormous amounts of information. So as a patient, um, it helps a great deal in negotiating the medical system to be able to understand some aspects of the disease, to understand what they're talking about. Um, and so uh, I'd say go to those websites and you know look up what fall, small fiber neuropathy means or what a tilt test is. And you can get detailed information um, about what what they're going to do and what they what they get out of it. Um, I you know I'm an, I, w w I'm a retired academic, so um, also uh, go to you know if you're adventuresome and you want to go to PubMed, you can find the the medical literature, and there are the abstracts of the papers, even if the papers themselves are behind paywalls. Um, I'm lucky because I'm a retired academic and um, I'm able to use the resources of Harvard University as a, as a corresponding member of the faculty. Um, so we all know that medical diagnosis and treatment of ME-CFS is highly siloed by specialties and that uh, people have their own set of symptoms and treatments that they know about. Um, and the treatment's always, almost always dealing with individual symptoms one by one. And the scientific understanding of it's also highly siloed in the same way. Uh, but this can make it difficult to sort out the primary and secondary causes of ME-CFS symptoms. It makes it hard to connect the dots, so to speak, if there are dots to be connected. So um, for the past year, I've been fortunate in being able to participate in the NIH effort to make a roadmap for ME-CFS research uh, in the capacity of a person with lived experience, not as a scientist, as a parent of two grown children with ME-CFS. Um, and uh, if you look at what, what their working groups are, uh, nervous system, immune system, metabolism, physiology, circulation, genomics, and other pathologies, uh, you see that there are a bunch of different perspectives and, you, and often they're not very overlapping. Um, uh, and there is a set of webinars on each of these areas that uh, is available online publicly. And uh, it, really it's an excellent introduction to the um, clinician and researcher uh, presentations. So what does dysautonomia mean? Uh, so it's it's a general umbrella term for disorders of the autonomic nervous system. So it's not a specific disease, syndrome, or diagnosis. Dysautonomia is not a diagnosis, but a blanket term that refer, refers to the neural causes of functional impairments. 
Uh, it's mainly used by neurologists and something like up to 80% of ME-CFS patients have dysautonomias, according to Dr. Komarov, um, especially orthostatic intolerance, POTS, and others. Um, but I was surprised because I was not familiar with uh, the term dysautonomia. I first became aware of ME-CFS. Um, but it actually is an older term that seems to predate um, CFS and ME and, and fibromyalgia. Um, so if you go to the website of Dysautonomia International, they talk about different kinds of dysautonomia, which we will do in a minute, and, and also um, the symptoms that include tachycardia, brachycardia, um, chest pains, lack of blood flow, all sorts of things, cognitive impairments, brain fog, and many of these symptoms overlap with those of ME-CFS. Um, so I was a little confused about how they think about what 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 are dysautonomias and what what and how they distinguish between that and MECFS. Um, so if you look at the the sort of symptoms in common between MECFS and um, dysautonomia, and and these are also many symptoms that overlap with long COVID and Gulf War syndrome and chemotherapy and acute phases of viral infections. Um, you know, the, the cardinal symptoms of ME-CFS are chronic fatigue, physical and mental fatigue, brain fog, unrefreshing sleep, orthostatic intolerance, POTS, uh, syncope, fainting, uh, and post-exertional malaise. And post-exertional malaise, I think, is one of the unique, uh, one of the unique um, uh, symptoms that's uh, uh, in the ME-CFS syndrome world and not necessarily in the dysautonomia world. Um, and then they, there are a bunch of other uh, disorders that many CFS patients have, but they're, they're, they're classified as dysautonomias. Uh, and of course, there are these comorbidities that also appear in many CFS patients. Um, so there are sort of two poles of thought. One is, you know, these symptoms are collections of symptoms and um, there may be separate causes or multiple separate causes, uh, or there could be common causes that are that are, that are uh, generating these, these central symptoms. Um, and we'll talk about, about that. Um, so in the past, you know, I, I discovered the mass MECFS YouTube channel only a few days ago, and I was looking at the history of ME and CFS. Um, and of course, there's always been this debate about the different definitions and what symptoms count as what. Um, but there's a collection of these syndrome, sy symptoms that, are, that, that constitute the syndrome. So in order to understand dysautonomias, you need to understand the autonomic nervous system and what it does. And um, neuroscientists um, you know, divide the neural nervous system into the central nervous system, which consists of the brain, the brain and the spinal cord, um, and the peripheral nervous system. So all of these neurons are encased uh, within the um, blood-brain barrier and bathed in cerebrospinal fluid, uh, and, and the peripheral nervous system, which is all the nerves that go out into the body that connect the brain with your muscles, uh, that allow you to move around and behave, uh, and your uh, body organs and tissues and vasculature and skin. Um, so, um, these, these organs are not protected. The peripheral system is not protected by the blood-brain barrier. So it's more open to pathogens and noxious uh, um, agents and, and things like that, all sorts of insults. So the autonomic nervous system, uh, uh, is its function is body regulation. It, it's maintaining control of the organs and the of the body in order to maintain system integrity and all of its basic functions of survival. Um, it's like a thermostat system uh, and it has different parts, you know, 
There are sensory in information coming from the body organs and tissue that me measure the current state of the body, like sensing the blood pressure. Um, there are commands to body organ and organs and tissues that change the action of the body organs and tissues, like speeding up or slowing down the heart rate. Um, and these, um, and there's a central command part that that decides what commands to send on the basis of what the sense state of the body is. So um, there's a sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system that prepares the body for action. In other words, when you need to act on the external world, um, you don't want digestion going on. Uh, you 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 want to uh, quiet those organs that you don't need for action. Um, and the parasympathetic branch is the relax and rest part of the autonomic nervous system. It uh, tamps down activity. It relaxes those organs um, so that they can recover and do what they need to do. Uh, and some people also divide out the enteric nervous system, which is the part of the autonomic nervous system that senses and regulates the gastrointestinal system. So a more, you know, complete taxonomy of the nervous system, the, the autonomic nervous system is, is part of the peripheral nervous system because it goes out into the body. The nerves are, are in the body and not within the spinal cord and brain. Uh, however, um, there's a central part, the central controller part of the autonomic nervous system is the hypothalamus, it's in the brain. Um, so functionally, you can think of the hypothalamus as being a part of the of the whole functional autonomic nervous system, and it's sending commands down to the autonomic nervous system in the periphery, and it's getting sensory information from the body organs and surfaces and all that. So if we look at the the circuitry, and this is just the command neurons. There are the circuitry with the sympathetic part that generally um, uh, prepares these organs for action. And there's a uh, circuitry uh, efferent com uh, sensor command. Th th these are all command neurons. Uh, the, the, the sensory neurons are not shown, uh, but um, there are also neural um, pathways that that relax and control uh, these organs. Now, so there's this ladder of control, levels of control and sensing and commanding um, all the way uh, going from the body, organs and tissues uh, up to relays, which are in the brainstem and up to the hypothalamus, uh, which is deciding what to do and adjusting things. Um, and there can be disruptions at any one of these levels. Um, so, we're, And we're gonna talk about those. Of note, there's this vagus nerve, which um, slows the heart and um, um, tamps down on GI, GI um, functions. Um, but also there's a sensory part of the vagus nerve that senses uh, when there are um, disruptions in your GI system, like when you have an infection, a GI infection. And it sends messages up through the brain stem and to the and that eventually reach the hypothalamus to tell you that your body is under attack or you've got food poisoning or, or some sort of, um, um, imbalance. So this is basically the same thing. Um, again, it's just the motor side of the auditory nervous system. Uh, and it's got pictures of all the organs. Um, and of course, you know, if you damage the the command, command pathways that increase the heart rate, um, then or, or you turn them on, and you can't turn them off, uh, you get tachycardia, uh, or if you if you can't turn them on, you get brachycardia. Uh, and one of the very important functions of the autonomic nervous system is to 
control peripheral vaso vasoconstriction. In other words, your veins, when you stand up, in order to keep your the blood from rushing all down to your legs and depriving your brain of oxygen and blood, um, your veins immediately constrict. Uh, and that's a very fast process in most people. Um, but if you have orthostatic intolerance and these control circuits are damaged, then um, you may feel faint in standing up. And in the longer you stand up, because it takes a long time for the system to adjust, um, you, you may feel fainter and fainter. So um, that's going to be an important part of what might be causing some of the other uh, symptoms of MECFS. So the central control of the autonomic nervous system is in the hypothalamus. And as I said, I think functionally the hypothalamus is the brain portion of the autonomic system. Um, but neurologists, I think, probably would not classify injuries to the hypothalamus as dysautonomias per se, because they're thinking of the peripheral system. It's not just one structure, but it's a bunch of different nuclei that do different things. We'll talk about all the different things that, that the hypothalamus does, but we're not going to get into the weeds about what does what. Um, and there are some things we should remember. Um, you know, there, there's a blood-brain barrier, um, but the brain also has mast cells. It has its own infla inflammatory and immune system. Um, that um, make inflammatory molecules that then generally alert the immune immune cells to come in and clean things up. And so there, there's an important concept that we need that inflammation is about the alerting of this defense system and general nonspecific immune activation. Uh, and then immune and autoimmune responses or specific attacks. Um, an autoimmune attack is a, an attack on your own cells. Um, um, but an immune attack is usually, hopefully, directed at pathogens. So uh, Peter, it looks like you're muted. We can't hear you for the second. Um, there you how go. far back? Did, just on this slide? Just this slide, yeah. Okay, great. So the hypothalamus does a whole lot of things, a whole lot of important things in terms of regulating blood pressure and heart rate and body temperature and, and GI action and appetite, feeding behavior, energy and water balance, Metabolism. If you if you impair the hypothalamus, you can induce diabetes, um, and uh, also importantly, uh, pupillary dilation, eye moisture, um, and it also regulates arousal, wakefulness, and uh, circadian rhythms and sleep. And that's that. And so. Um, and it's also a neuroendocrine organ that also controls, in the end, cortisol release, which is tamps down on inflammation in the in the body. So it's this, and we'll see a slide on that in a second. So if you disrupt any of these functions, like being able to be able to control your blood pressure, you get orthostatic intolerance intoler and lack of blood and oxygen to the brain. Uh, if you can't control heart rate, you get tachycardia or brachycardia, and that can come on suddenly and, all, and also cause, in and of itself, physiological causes of anxiety. Um, there's um, thermal regulation uh, dysfunctions. You can get GI problems and gastroparesis or no sweating or excessive sweating, um, you know, increased hunger and weight gain, urin increased urination. Um, blurred vision, uh, and very importantly, potentially sleep disturbances. We're going to talk about what's called the glymphatic system, which is how the, how the brain takes out its trash. And 
And, and that's only during uh, deep sleep. So if you disrupt sleep, you're also disrupting that system. So um, oh, it's not advancing. Let's see. There we go. So um, as I said, the, the hypothalamus is also important in regulating the level of inflammation in the, in the whole body. Um, and it's, again, this feedback system like a thermostat. And if you disrupt any part of it, um, you disrupt the control and the ability to tamp down an inflammation. Um, so there are different failure modes, things that ways that things can go awry. Um, and they can, they can go awry in the central control circuits or in the relays or in the autonomic system out in the, in the body itself. And um, I'm going to go from the, the, the periphery up to the central. If you have damage to the peripheral autonomic neurons, uh, which come under the rubric of dysautonomias and small fiber neuropathy, neuropathies, you basically can damage the control signals and the sensory signals that the brain has to control those, those functions. So um, diabetes produces peripheral neuropathies. It damages the nerve endings. Uh, so the, so the, the brain is not getting the information it needs to be able to regulate what's going on. And people go numb and they can lose their, their extremities from that. Um, acute infections or ongoing covert or occult infections um, can uh, disrupt that system. Uh, there can be reactivation of latent viruses by a new infection. Uh, and these viruses like to hang out in, in neurons, in the axons and cell bodies of neurons, and they can travel up the neurons. So, so we'll see that's a possible way that they can get into the, that they can get into the relay stations and the, and the central control circuits. Um, there's inflammation, and the inflammation itself these nonspecific warning signals um, can can disrupt um, uh, the sensing and and, and affecting and control over uh, the the body organs. And finally, there can be autoimmune attack of autonomic nerves. Um, and at the level of the relays, you can impair the neural signals that are going up to the control circuits. Again, there can be direct infection or injury. That's fairly rare unless you're in a car accident or something like that. Um, you know, injuries to the spinal cord and the ganglia. Um, but um, there can be over ongoing uh, occult infections that create false signals, like uh, in the vagus nerve, uh, via the vagus nerve. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And inflammation. Uh, that can also create a mirror inflammation in the brain and an autoimmune attack of autonomic ganglia. And then there can be this damage to central control circuits. Um, and some of the ways that that can happen are, um, again, if you don't have adequate cerebral oxygen supply, if you um, deprive someone of oxygen, um, they'll get drowsy and fatigued um, pretty rapidly. There can be direct injury, you know, like a, a stroke or a, a brain injury, um, which is more rare in terms of ME-CFS. Um, there can be reactivation, again, of latent viruses and inflammation and autoimmune attack and also mitochondrial dysfunctions. Um, so neurologists uh, often mention small fiber neuropathy, and they talk in those terms. And that is a, that's a diagnosis of, of dysfunction of particular sets of neurons in the autonomic nervous system, uh, in the peripheral nervous system. And there's something like 15 to 20 million people in the U.S. who uh, have small fiber neuropathy of, of some kind or another. Most of them are diabetics. Um, and the small fibers, what small fibers means is that you have these neurons, different neurons have different thicknesses. They some of them, the fast ones, um, the fast ones have a myelin sheath, and that lets them uh, conduct signals 10 to 100 times faster than the ones that don't have that sheath. And so 
uh, the systems that give you your senses, like vision and audition, are mostly myelinated because you need to have in that information really quickly. It's coming in very quickly. Um, but the systems that uh, are registering things like um, an acute pain as well, um, the systems that are, are uh, sending information about aches and body surface temperatures and itching uh, don't need to be so fast and they are unmyelinated. They're called C fibers and they're slow. So um, if you have dysfunctions related to the sensory parts of the autonomic nervous system, you may be numb. Uh, you may have chronic sensations of pain or warmth or um, any of the senses that go through those, those systems. Um, and the, the skin sensory systems also have separate pathways. Um, and you may be hypersensitive to particular kinds of stimuli. Um, on the other hand, if there are dis disruptions to the autonomic efference, again, um, the, the system can lose control over the vascular tone. And that means that it can't constrict or dilate blood vessels when it needs to. And that can cause cerebral hypoperfusion and fainting and dizziness. And if it's chronic, you could potentially cause many of the cardinal symptoms of ME-CFS like brain fog and sleep problems and all that. And many people in the research community, I think, think that it's hypo, it, it, it's a lack of blood supply to the, to the brain, uh, blood and oxygen supply, we should say, to the brain that, that causes all these symptoms. And indeed, um, some people are benefited by uh, oxygen therapy, either hyperbaric or, or not, or, you know, just uh, oxygen enrichment. And, um, you know, there have been some reports that blood transfusions help, uh, but they help for like a month. So um, it's a mixed, it's a mixed bag. Um, but that, that's one of the ways that people think about it. Uh, there can be heart rate dysregulations. So your heart rate can change um, very rapidly in some types of POTS, and that can be very disconcerting. Um, there are so-called pseudomotor dysfunctions where sweating is disrupted uh, one way or another, either increased or decreased. And um, neurologists have, autonomic neurologists have a whole battery of tests to assess how much damage, how much um, loss of function there is in, in, in these autonomic nerves, um, you know, related to uh, sweat and uh, many of it related to sweat, but also pupillary function and GI and urinary function and all that. So um, again, to recapitulate, um, there are three ways that neural functions can be disrupted. You can disrupt the peripheral nerves because the, these nerves are out there in the periphery exposed to pathogens and inflammatory agents and other factors. Um, things can go awry. Um, we talked a little bit about diabetes. There are other risk factors. Um, and you can have autoimmune responses and damage to the, the sensory nerves and the receptors, as well as the efferent nerves and the commands. And then um, the relay stations can, um, can, can be disrupted in, in, in various ways. We'll talk about that a bit more. Um, uh, Van Elsacker. I, I discovered his paper early on when, when I was trying to figure out what the hell is MECFS. Um, and it's one of the few papers that tries to put it all together. Um, so he thinks that alarm signals can be sent to the relay stations via sensory afferents of the autonomic nervous system. In other words, this vagus nerve, um, cool. the vagus nerve is this long, is this very long nerve and it's innervating it's relaxing the heart and it's also innervating the, um, the gut, uh, the stomach uh, and liver and gut. And it's also receiving signals from sensory signals from those organs and going back to the, back to the brainstem and the, and the hypothalamus. Uh, so it's called a mixed nerve and it's called vagus because it's a wandering nerve. It, it goes all over the body. 
it's got its hands in all parts of the body, uh, it seems, almost. So um, the thing is, is that it could be, a, it's been known for a while that it can, can be a conduit from the gut to the brainstem, the so-called gut-brain axis. And um, pro-inflammatory cytokines in the gut, um, uh, the, these alert alarm signals can travel up the sensory part of the vagus nerve and send warning signals to the, the um, brainstem and up to the hypothalamus. Um, and his, his theory is that this causes the hypothalamus to go into a sort of sickness mode and to shut down and to conserve energy and shut down um, activity so that the body can fight fight off whatever it thinks is going on in the gut. Um, and I, I highly recommend um, his paper, but he gave a talk uh, four years ago, just before uh, the pandemic uh, for, for our organization. Uh, and I, I highly recommend that. Um, so uh, lastly, um, these inflammatory cytokine molecules can travel up the vagus nerve to the brainstem relay stations where they provoke a, a sort of knock-on mirror response in the immune system of the brain. Um, there are these immune cells, the microglia, uh, that, can, that can go into action. They're, they're inflammatory cells and mast cells in the brain and immune cells in the brain that can impair its function. That's a that's another um, related theory, uh, and yes, we'll talk about that in a minute. So um, the third way is that the central control mechanisms in the hypothalamus can be disrupted, and if you disrupt the hypothalamus, um, depending upon which parts of the hypothalamus you disrupt, you could potentially disrupt many of those functions that we listed, um, you know, including sleep cycles and metabolism and immune response um, and stress adaptation. Um, and I'm, I'm, my understanding is that parts of the hypothalamus and pituitary gland, because they're neurosecretory organs, they're also in communication with better communication with the blood and cerebrospinal fluid the most parts of the brain, so they're less protected. Um, and this brain bar blood brain barrier is more permeable than was previously thought, you know, decades ago. It's more like a pump system uh, rather than a barrier per se. Um, so HPA is therefore susceptible to inflammation. Uh, and we, in the last decade, people are understanding that there's extensive communications between neural and immune systems. There's a theory of ME-CFS based on these neural and in, interactions between neural and immune systems. So another thing that could be going on is that these incoming false alarm signals don't shut off. Uh, and so if you have an occult infection in the gut or if it's traveled up to the brainstem uh, in some way, you can have this ongoing hypothalamic sickness response. Now, um, apparently, um, in, in uh, Komarov's talk, which I'll reference uh, uh, in a minute, um, for, um, for our organization a year ago, he talks about these experiments that were done in rats where they injected E. coli into the gut of rats. They behave like we would if we had food poisoning or the flu or, or some other um, uh, infection in our guts. And then they cut the they cut the um, the the vagus nerve just above the the gut, and the and the rats return to normal uh, very quickly. So that to me is 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 extremely suggestive of of the of the plausibility um, of this sort of uh, generalized sickness response uh, and the role of uh, the vagus nerve in incoming signals. So as I said, you know, you can also have inflammation and immune attack in the brain. 
and there's um, there's a paper that uh, references those both inflammation and autoimmune and uh, mitochondrial disruption. Um, so they, they sort of have suggest multiple thing multiple possible roles. I think um, the glymphatic system could be involved because this is a waste clearance system that was only discovered um, by a Danish um, neurophysiologist about a decade ago. Uh, and during slow wave sleep, um, and there's a there's a video, an animation of this on the YouTube, on the video, um, sorry, the wiki, Wikipedia page, uh, that, that it, when it's activated, there are these waves of, of pulses in, in the brain that um, shunt uh, waste products from, from the, the cerebrospinal fluid in the brain to, to the blood supply and the tissues uh, to, to uh, uh, the veins where they can get disposed of. Um, so, you know, a natural thing to think, to wonder about is whether the impairment of the glymphatic system might be generating major symptoms of ME-CFS and you know, if you deprive someone of sleep, they become fatigued after a few, after a day or two, um, and they get brain fog and drowsiness, um, and inflammation increases and immune responses. Uh, you know, notably increased irritability, which I'm not sure goes along with MECFS phenotype. But, but so in, there's a paper that's proposed that we'll talk a bit about more. Uh, of that, because if the glymphatic system is being disrupted, then then you're disrupting the whole brain in various ways. Um, so I, you know, I have my differences with this paper that just recently came out. You know, their 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 labeling of their their conceptualization of of things in terms of effort preference is just tone deaf. Um, but what I like about it is that they actually try to put things together in, in kind of a, um, a global map of how, how there could be many triggers um, and different processes, you know, both in the hypothalamus and or in the autonomic nervous system that are generating the, ma the major symptoms of MECFS. Um, uh, and... Um, Anyway, there we can discuss it, but but the good thing is that there are people in the research community thinking about trying to put together the dots. Uh, and even though I, I disagree with some of what they say, um, they're at least trying to do the right thing in terms of putting the pieces together. So this is my my mental map. After all this this year, you know, four years of attending various webinars of the Dysautonomia International and MECFS, um, and and as much as I can understand of of the literature, uh, plus our own experiences, and then the last year of the webinars of the of the roadmap, the NIH roadmap group groups. Um, this is sort of what I take away from it all. Um, and again, you can have these distal causes and triggers, um, you know, different kinds of infections and insults, um, chemical exposure that creates a disruption um, in the in the body uh, that can reactivate latent viruses like EVV um, and and you know and herpes as well. Um, and ongoing occult infections in the tissues. Um, and this can cause inflammation, a cytokine storm in the gut and periphery. Um, and that can get transmitted up to the vagus nerve. And then the vagus nerve is either sending false signals to the hypothalamus, or there can be this mirror activation of inflammation in the brain. Um, so then you can get mast cell and micro glia activation in the brain that can also disrupt the hypothalamus directly. And lastly, there can be autoimmune responses attacking the autonomic nerves or hypothalamus. Um, and if that, if that occurs, then the hypothalamus can generate, you know, will generate dysautonomias, can generate dysautonomias 
that cause the peripheral systems, the per peripheral regulation of blood pressure, pressure to go awry. Uh, you get loss of vascular tone and then the brain's not getting enough oxygen. Um, and that's a major way that a lot of people think that these symptoms could be generated. But there's also potentially disruption of lymphatic clearance, and that also could cause these systemic kinds of um, neural cognitive um, impairments. Um, and, and there could be met metabolic disruptions as well. I saw a paper and I cannot find it, that argued that the hypothalamus can control mitochondrial functions directly. So I, you know, I made that figure um, two or three days ago. And, and then I came across, again, our, our YouTube website, which I highly recommend, um, and, and a talk by Dr. Kamaroff uh, a year ago in which he discusses the sickness response and the rat vagus nerve experiment where they cut the nerve. Uh, and he's talking about many triggers in a final common pathway, which is um, the way that I was, I and von Elsacker and others have been thinking about these things. Um, and these sort of three ways in which you could have, um, you could have disruptions of the system. So um, he, he has, you know, he's taking the opinion that there might be underlying common causes. Um, and um, so this is the last theory slide I have. So um, what, what makes the MECFS state self-sustaining? Um, normally the acute sickness state is temporary and it resolves itself. You know, you feel if you get the flu, you're down for a couple of days and then you go to sleep and you're, you're better after that. Um, my son, uh, had, you know, in, in the four years that he's been disabled, has had about two very brief episodes, one of about two hours after he got um, a COVID vaccine and another for about six hours, one, one afternoon and evening when he said that suddenly his brain fog lifted um, and he had more energy and he felt like normal again, but then it reverted. Um, so I think that um, there could be, um, you know, some sort of master switch. We need to look for it. You know, we need to deal with the symptoms one by one, but we also need to, if we don't look for some sort of cures, uh, we, won't, we won't find them. Um, you know, and I, I think about the example of, um, of uh, uh, peptic ulcers, you know, which everyone thought had a variety of causes, and, and, and it turns out that there's a much simpler explanation. So, so MECFS could be a vicious cycle in which all these things are connected, uh, and they, 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 make, they make the other processes worse. Um, but the flip side of a vicious cycle is a virtuous cycle. So if you can improve one, one uh, part of the cycle, you improve the other ones. Um, and in my son's case, I wish we had been able to improve his sleep uh, because I think that, that his sleep deprivation made other things much, much worse. So in more practical matters, um, I'm a neuroscientist, so this is not medical advice, but you know, you need to find the right appropriate medical specialist. It's difficult. Rely on the patient advocacy organizations to steer you in the right direction because you may not be able to talk to the specialist for six months or a year or maybe more than that. And uh, finding the competent specialist is complicated by widespread ignorance of MECFS by PCPs, primary care, first line providers. Um, and there are long waiting times to see specialists, especially as new patients. And sometimes there are roadblocks that, that are thrown up by the gatekeepers, like that you have to get a tilt table test before you can see someone who's knowledgeable about dysautonomias. Um, so you need a cooperative and open-minded PCP. Um, and that's really essential. Uh, you know, if, if your PCP isn't helping, helping you get through this, uh, find... Try to find someone else. And that's hard too. So um, 
It's important to also find specialists familiar with symptoms and treatments. Um, they're particular to MECFS. You know, you want to find a neurologist whose uh, specialization is in dysautonomias and can do proper tilt table tests and or other um, neural tests. You want to find cardiologists who are familiar with orthostatic intolerance and POTS. You want to find sleep doctors who are not just going to look for narcolepsy and sleep apnea, but are also going to deal with chronic insomnia, which is the central problem of MECFS. Um, and you want to deal with, you want to find immunologists who know the specific specifics of MECFS and possible autoimmune treatments. Um, and as we know, many of us don't get proper treatment and diagnosis and treatment for several years. But I think it's possible that the situation might have improved because of the, the, the abatement of the COVID pandemic, increased awareness of long COVID. So there are people in long COVID clinics who I think, I hope, know about this um, and can be of help. Um, I'm not going to go through all the diagnostic tests because Shayla, um, Shayla has a lot of, has some, some things to say. Um, but um, uh, if you if you're looking at various tests, go to YouTube, go to our channel, uh, go to the Dysautonomy International and Dysautonomy Project. You can find special information and clinician videos that will tell you everything you want to know about that. Um, the only thing I have to say is that the table can be very tedious for someone with orthostatic intolerance or POTS. So just, just, you know, one way or another, you're going to have to uh, endure it. The usefulness of the tilt table test is that, is it it documents in an objective way some of your symptoms? Um, and that can be important for insurance and insurance coverage of other tests and also disability. Um, and we've gone down that path. Um, there are therapies for dysautonomias, but they're, they're, mostly related to methods to expand blood volume, to deal with orthostatic intolerance, and methods to, to um, calm down the heart in, in dealing with tachycardia. Um, and the best thing to do is to go to those websites. Um, since some of the doctors that, that know, the neurologists who know about dysautonomias don't necessarily, I mean, they may think that exercise is a unalloyed good thing, um, they may not be, they may or they may not be aware of PEM and the dangers of exercise for the MECFS patients. So be careful about over-exercising, pace yourself, do it, do it in a graded manner, um, monitor your responses to it, you know, in the following days and adjust your levels accordingly and keep your doctors in the loop. So I think that that's about all I have to say. And Hala um, has a bunch of things to say as well. Um, so I hope that that's useful. Take it away, Hala. All right. Um, thank you, Peter, for that very um, concise and very um, full tutorial. I'm sure it will be helpful for people to um, go back and look at and review, um, you know, the connections there. And I'm seeing many, many questions for that. So I won't take um, too long. Um, but I just wanted to quickly recap. Um, next slide, please. Um, is that, you know, one thing I'm sure, you know, people have observed that it's a little bit different for everybody. There isn't just one um, symptom or one way that it's presenting. Um, it can, can also, what can be tricky for doctors to hear is that it can occur at different times. It's very unpredictable. You know, it can be the classic transition from lying to standing, but also with prolonged standing, prolonged sitting also, or walking. Um, I won't go over the lower part because um, Peter so well described those. But what I wanted to leave with was just some, um, uh, if you go to the next slide, um, are some... Uh, this is again what um, Peter had mentioned. If you see here are most of the um, POTS and dysautonomia symptoms, e there's even more on here, but many of them overlap with ME. Um, perhaps PEM, you know, the, the most um, 
reflective of ME is not so far observed in dysautonomia. Um, but you can imagine with all these very symptoms here, and it's not even the comprehensive list, those can affect you, you know, greatly as you are um, going throughout, uh, you know, trying to work with your day. And so some things to think about are um, accommodations. Um, and next slide, please. So um, clearly, you know, I appreciate with ME um, that many patients are, you know, were unfortunately bed bound um, and can't have had to let go of work, the workplace or even students that can go to school. Um, and I recognize that. What I wanted to leave here were some suggestions for people that are more moderate. Um, there's two uh, very great references, uh, places to go to Sodonomia Youth Network of America. Um, that's very helpful with uh, children and young adults and Dysautonomia International. Um, so if you look just quickly, because I know there's a lot of questions for Peter, but students, some of the, you know, classic ones would be to provide notes. Um, one place I found actually did this anonymously, which was very nice. So the students um, would let, let the teacher know if they needed notes and they had a, then a separate person volunteer to take notes. So there was a little bit of more like um, space between that, a little more personal dignity, um, you know, extension on tests, reduction of work, virtual classes. Um, we've all learned with, you know, the pandemic are possible. So that would be a very good accommodation. Living near classes because of the issues with walking and unpredictability. Um, hard copy of books if they use books anymore. <laughs> Um, information about future assignments so you're not left with surprises, you know, to try to balance your energy for the last few minutes. Um, how to manage your timing too, um, if that's needed, if, you know, brain fog is setting in, that's a little hard to organize. Um, tutoring for missed information, not just if you miss the class, but again, for brain fog. Um, allowing for snacks and water and breaks if needed. Quiet places, because many times there's um, hearing some you know, sensory issues, no penalty for missing classes or leaving if needed. Um, and also, you know, for teachers to be mindful, not calling out the students. And um, then in an ideal workplace, we would have this almost mirrored where, you know, there would be the best ergonomic situation, you know, can, can a person find a place to sit down or put their feet up or, you know, sit um, inclined, allow also for workload extensions and reduction of the work day virtual meetings. Um, you can see here, and these will be provided again. I just want to speed up a little because it's five. These will be provided in um, a copy of Peter's slide. So if, if you look, you'll see that it's almost a mirror of what, you know, young people need is not too much unlike what, you know, a person would need who's trying to go to work with, you know, at a workplace and even at home um, for some of these accommodations. Um, so I'll uh, give it back to Peter if you, uh, for all the questions. And um, thank you for coming again today. Uh, Helen, do you want to do the? Yeah, I have my video. Oh, thank you. There we go. <laughs> Thanks. I'll, I'll mute myself. <laughs> sure. Thank you, Hala, so much for that portion. And thank you, Peter, for yours. Um, we do have a lot of questions coming in. Um, I know we can stay. If anybody has to go, um, we will keep the recording obviously online, but we will try to go through maybe about 10 to 15 minutes of questions now um, from what's in the chat. So, and I apologize. I actually have to leave in like 10 minutes. So you might want to just focus on Peter's because that was the bulk, obviously, of the talk. So thank you. Gotcha. Thank you, Hala. Um, so Peter, to start, um, I'm going to start from some of the ones from close to the beginning. Um, some people asked, why are some severe ME patients severely affected by light and sound? And where in the brain might that originate in terms of the dysautonomia anatomy you described? Um, that's a great question. Um... And, you know, disruption of pupillary response can make it difficult to adjust to changes in light levels, for example. Um, I'm not sure about sound. Actually, being an auditory neuroscientist, um, you know, I wonder about that. Um, but basically, if, if you have impairment of receptors in the periphery, of one sort or another, uh, you can get hypersensitivities. You know, they're, they're already um, 
uh, on the verge of being excited, let's say. And so a, a small stimulus can, can create a big response in the sensory uh, organs of the skin uh, and, and other bodily organs. Um, so that would be one one possible way of thinking about that. Uh, but it is a problem because, you know, uh, life today is now so dependent on computer screens and um, it's easy for someone with ME-CFS to tire, you know, looking at these screens uh, for lengthy periods of time. So I hope and that's useful. Uh, another question is asking, um, kind of in the onset of illness, for a lot of people, it starts with this viral infection, um, and kind of similar to what you're talking about, Peter, I think of that acute cycle of, you know, you have the flu or something, you get over it. Um, this question is kind of asking, um, in terms of people with ME, what happens in that kind of downstream elements of the illness if it is coming from some kind of viral onset? Well, the question is how, how like, a recent infection might become self-sustaining you know, what process might turn that switch on and turn on that vicious cycle. Um, and the, the, the three ones that they talk about it are, you could have the, the infection go into the tissues, you know, most likely nervous neurons. And so you have a virus that's hanging out in the neurons and it's disrupting neural function, or it's causing the neurons to fire more often. So to give off these false signals, um, or uh, you could have inflammation uh, that's a knock-on effect of the, of, the, um, of, of the infection, or you could have an autoimmune response. So apparently um, some of the surface antigens that viruses express, um, there are some, some of these surface antigens that are also on nerves. Uh, and so um, that's a way in which the, the immune system can mount a response to the pathogen. But if it's, if it's a more general response, it might also include attacking the neurons because they look sort of like the pathogen in some way or another. Um, and that's the way that an autoimmune response could ensue. Um, so the question is sort of, how do these things become ongoing and self-sustaining. Uh, and once you get once you get these disruptions of a hypothalamus, once it goes that far, uh, you could have just the hypothalamic dysfunctions creating, you know, glymphatic dysfunctions and and hypo perfusion that are self-sustaining. I, I that would be my guess, but um, no one really has the answer. Sure. I know sometimes we get questions that are really insightful, but again, we might not have all the information yet, as obviously your talk has kind of pointed out. Um, another question that we have from our audience members has included, um, if you have any advice, I know you put this kind of in the end for your um, PDF version, but for someone who has symptoms of dysautonomia that impact their daily life, but maybe subclinical during a medical appointment, um, and you talked about certain testing, but basically, is there anything else that they can do or advice that you would give to that kind of scenario? Well, it, it's always really good to make to write up a medical history of, you know, all your C ME CFS problems, even previous problems, but write it up, uh, you know, and in you know, like a two page executive summary of all the things that you're experiencing. Um, when you go to a doctor's office, I mean, not only specialists, but also your PCP, um, and, um, and, you know, think through all the different kinds of symptoms that you have, because, and if you do that uh, with a list of symptoms that you have also, you know, put that at the end, um, they that may trigger some thinking in your in your doctor as far as things to look for. Um, so I think in terms of organizing for a medical appointment, that's always a good thing. Um, and have a list of questions for them uh, about you know about your 
your condition and what might be going on and possible um, treatments. The more you know about what they do and how they think about things, the better off you are in in getting something useful out of out, out of seeing them and being in their care and participating with them in your care. Sure. Um, scanning through some of the other questions, I think this will be included in the end, so I won't ask you this one directly, but a list of diagnostic tools related to dysautonomia. I think that will be in those last couple slides. Yeah. Uh, and someone the also best, had a... And again, the like, best thing to do is to, to go on... The quickest thing to do is to go on YouTube and look up dysautonomias, and you'll find probably, you know, 20 or 30 clinician talks about it. And they'll outline what tests they have and what they do and and what they tell them. Sure. I think um, from the questions we have, maybe we can end on this last question um, and then go through our wrap up. But this person is asking um, if nitric oxide or other precursors can help dilate the brain and other blood vessels, or is a bigger issue really just the transport of oxygen from arteries to brain cells? Um. It could be all sorts of things. I mean, what in the webinars, one of the things they talked about was platelet dysfunction. Uh, and and it was mentioned that someone received a transfusion of blood and that abated their symptoms for a month. Um, and other people have said that that oxygen therapy helps. So, you know, these are the sorts of things that do test the hypothesis that it's all hypoperfusion of, you know, the lack of blood and oxygen to the brain. Um, and so, you know, which is, could be a complicated, it can be a complicated process because uh, the oxygen has to be borne by the, by hemoglobin, you know, in the, in the, in the red blood cells and all that. So um, if the red blood cells are, are, are impaired in some way, that can, that can disrupt oxygen uptake in, in the brain. Um, these are the sorts of things that I think, you know, I wish, I think the NIH needs a, a research SWAT team. When someone says something like that, or they say that someone's had this improvement that's very rapid, I wish we could just jump on that and these are kinds of research questions that you could answer in a month or two. It doesn't take seven years like that study that I showed uh, to get a result. Um, and I think that we need to have, you know, we need to have ongoing long clinical longitudinal studies that go on for years, but we also need rapid answers to, to questions that may be able to eliminate whole whole avenues of, of causation. Um, so that's my opinion. Um, I think the science could go a lot faster than it's going. Um, and certainly, you know, better funding, you know, even just minimal funding would be a, a, a huge, big imp increase. And I'm hoping that it's on the way. I think we, we will, all share that sentiment. Yes, as we all do. <laughs> Yeah, and we will learn from long COVID because the overlap in, in the symptomology and in the problems is, is quite extensive. Um, so many, pe many people see these things as post-infection syndromes, uh, uh, which is helpful. And ideally, we would want a, an NIH institute that's dealing with post-infection syndromes, you know, just like cancer and AIDS and uh, all sorts of other diseases. Um, and once you get that, then there are, then there's a, a cohort of, of, of researchers and clinicians who are focused on it. Um, I, I don't know what the status of, of those ideas are, but that's the thing to hope for in terms of the research. Absolutely. Well, I think since we've hit just about the 515 mark, we can wrap it up for questions. Um, Peter, if you're on the slides, if you could go to the next. Yep. 
So I just want to thank you, Peter and Hala, again for sharing your thoughts today um, and insights from your professional practice and really shed a light on such a heavily requested topic of dysautonomias. Um, as a reminder, the recording of this session will be posted on our Mass ME YouTube channel um, as soon as we can, and you'll get an email when the recording is up. And obviously, please feel free to share the video with your friends and family or on social media. Um, and again, our next Sunday conversation event is going to be on April 21st, the third Sunday of the month at 4 p.m. Eastern time. And we will continue our series focusing on specific comorbidities. Um, we're going to be joined by Michael Rubino of the Change the Air Foundation, who will be giving us information about mold and how it affects us. So we really hope to see you there. Uh, next slide. Finally, uh, we'd like to ask if you found this program worthwhile, that there are a few ways you can help. You can make a donation to help support this series by donating online at this website, massmecfs.org slash donate. And on that same page, you can also sign up for the Mass ME newsletter. And if you donate $25 or more and check the option for become a member, you'll establish your membership or renew it. Um, and you'll be invited to some of our members only programs. So we really want to thank you all for coming and we hope to see you again next month. So thank you, everyone.